you know, I would just tell the native student to, to, um, to start early and exploring, you know, because you absolutely belong and, um, you know, don't ever tell yourself that you're not ready for higher education. Uh, but when you are ready, you know, higher education here in Minnesota will be ready for you. everyone. Welcome to Native Minnesota, a podcast about the Native American experience in Minnesota and beyond. I'm your host, Rebecca Crook Stratton, Secretary Treasurer of the Shakopee Midwakton Sioux Community. This podcast is a project of Understand Native Minnesota, a campaign focused on improving the narrative about Native Americans in Minnesota's public schools. Today, I'm glad to be joined by Dennis Olson, the Commissioner of the Minnesota Office of Higher Education. He is a member of the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa and has wide ranging experience in education here in Minnesota. Let's dive in. All right. Well, good morning, Commissioner Olson. Thank you so much for joining us on Native Minnesota. Uh, we're excited to visit with you today about uh, our education system really across the state and higher education in particular. Uh, currently, you're the Commissioner of the Minnesota Office of Higher Education, uh, starting that position in 2019, but you have held positions across Indian country and education in Minnesota uh, for a good chunk of your career. Uh, would you mind sharing a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure, not a problem. So uh, first of all, thanks for having me. Really appreciate the opportunity to share a little bit, uh, not only about you know my, my career, like you were mentioning, but also some of the work that the Office of Higher Education does. Um, I'm an enrolled citizen of the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior, Chippewa, and grew up in uh, in Cloquet, Minnesota, and then Duluth, Minnesota, um, on and, and near the Fond du Lac Reservation uh, most of my, my young years. Um, I had the, had the opportunity that I, I share often with, with colleagues uh, to attend uh, Tribal Head Start, actually. So I'm uh, I'm a product of of the Tribal Head Start system uh, at Fond du Lac, um, and you know, really that that gave me kind of my first start um, into the the differences uh, you know between between some of our education systems. I loved that when I was I was a, a young guy, three, four, five years old, having the opportunity to learn uh, our Ojibwe language. And I've kept some of that, you know, with me uh, throughout my throughout my life. But um, yeah, you know, I really I really had an incredible opportunity as an undergraduate student at the University of Minnesota to uh, work as an undergrad research assistant with the College of Education and the Institute on Community Integration. And we had um, we had federally funded grants to work with native students all across the state of Minnesota and work with students with disabilities all across the state uh, focused on their life after high school, what they wanted to do, whether that be you know, go to college, uh, look, at a, look at a career opportunity, uh, something in between, look at military options. And that was really what ignited my passion for for education. Um, I came to the university actually as um, an, an engineering student. I wanted to be an engineer and having that opportunity to work directly with, with native students that were only a few years younger than me at the time. I was, I was a sophomore when I started that position uh, at the university. And um, you know, I got, I got the opportunity to work as a, almost a peer mentor to, to native youth across the state. And you know, from there, I. Um, I, I had an incredible opportunity to serve the Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe as their commissioner of education and, um, you know, spent spent almost four years there um, working the entire spectrum of, of education for uh, for their tribal nation, uh, all the way from early childhood through through higher education. Uh, we also had boys and girls clubs there and um, it, it was just it was a great experience and you know from there was actually asked to serve by uh, by tribal leaders as the executive director of the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council and from there now in into my current position um, you know there's been a theme I think throughout my career and that's um, of all the positions uh, I've held I've, I've been really asked to serve and it's it's been you know something I've had to to respond to and you know it's been an honor 
um, you know, to, to step into roles, to be able to serve, um, you know, my own communities and to serve my own, my own people and, and do it through, uh, through the lens of education. It's just been incredible. So I, I am appreciative of the journey I've, I've been on, um, and, and where I am currently and, um, look forward to, to building upon that, uh, further on in my career if, if needed. Yeah. I think that, um, being asked to serve is a common theme across our indigenous nations here in Minnesota. Uh, our people recognize talent in our communities. And, you know, I think it's great that they foster that talent and, and encourage it. So that's wonderful to hear. I know I've been on a similar path too. I want to back up to, to one thing you talked about. You talked about Head Start. Um, Head Start is a great program and something I think most of us in indigenous communities um, know about. Out, but can you talk a little bit more about Head Start, kind of explaining what it is and kind of the importance uh, it has in preparing students for uh, kind of that mainstream educational system? Yeah, Head Start's, uh, like I said, an incredible uh, program, uh, federally funded and is just, you know, one of the many um, early childhood options that, that are on the on the menu for for parents looking, uh, you know, looking for their students or their 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 young ones to to get a leg up and to learn about you know what it's what it's going to uh, take or, or be like in in elementary school and you know Head Start provides um, provides families that maybe don't have the opportunity to access traditional uh, early child care uh, early education. Uh, it, it gives them the opportunity to ha to have those same uh, those same benefits as well. So uh, Head Start in in Indian country has been around for for decades, but you know, there there are Head Start programs in in communities all across the the nation that that fulfill that role to make sure that you know there's there's equitable access for for all families to early childhood and quality early childhood education. Yeah. And I think that equitable access is something we're, we're going to dive into at some point uh, during this discussion. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about your current position position right now. Um, you're the commissioner of the Minnesota Office of Higher Education. Uh, what what do you do day to day? Um, what does what does it mean to be the commissioner of higher education? And really, how did you come to be here? Yeah, thanks. Um, I'll answer your second question first, I guess, um, you know, how I came to the Office of Higher Education um, in this particular role as commissioner was actually uh, what I like to call, a th I walked through the open door. Um, what, I, what I really appreciated about uh, Governor Walls and Lieutenant Governor Flanagan's approach uh, to, to filling their cabinet, uh, filling the leadership positions within uh, their administration, was to, to have an open call for applications. And um, they did that early on um, after, after winning the election um, in, in 2019. And you know, just, just uh, an incredible process. I know they went through hundreds of applications of, of incredible leaders, um, you know, all with unique qualifications. And um, I was encouraged to, to apply uh, by, by quite a few trusted colleagues. Um, and I'll be honest with you, I was nervous to do so. I didn't, uh, you know, fully see myself in, in a role like this, but, um, you know, I trusted, uh, in, in their belief in me and, um, and took a shot. And I'm, I'm so thankful that, that Governor Walls and Lieutenant Governor Flanagan, um, you know, saw those, those leadership qualities in me that others did as well, um, and, and gave me an opportunity and, I think I bring a, a breath of fresh air to the agency. Um, the, the agency historically has been um, uh, the state agency that provides all student financial aid um, to, to Minnesota students uh, attending higher ed institutions. And you know, one of our flagship programs is the uh, Minnesota State Grant Program. We provide uh, grant funding to over 80,000 low and middle income uh, students in Minnesota, but that's just one of the of the many things we do at the Office of Higher Education. We you know we also have uh, a robust uh, research division that provides uh, necessary reports to the Minnesota Legislature on all things from you know student debt to 
um, to issues around uh, study abroad opportunities for, for students. Um, they also oversee our longitudinal data system, which really looks at, at data uh, from early childhood through uh, workforce. And so, you know, that's all housed within our agency. We have a, um, a state loan program, a low interest uh, loan called the self loan, the Minnesota self loan. We oversee uh, Minnesota's uh, 529 uh, program, the, the college savings account program for Minnesota. Um, and then one of our, our most exciting roles actually is that we have a, uh, a federally funded grant program um, through the Gear Up uh, program federally called in Minnesota, Get Ready. And we work with, uh, with middle and high schools all across the state, um, including uh, high schools within our tribal communities uh, to, to work on college preparation, essentially to build a a college going um, understanding, a college going culture uh, for students who typically may not see themselves in higher education. Um, it's, it's an exciting, exciting program to, to be able to offer and it's, it's direct service. And so we actually have our folks in, um, in schools working right alongside uh, educators um, to, to provide that information specific to, to higher ed options and, and leadership development. And so, uh, you know, we we have a myriad of different programs, but you know, we're we're a small team. We're we're one of the smallest state agencies um, in the in the state enterprise, but you know, are responsible for uh, for a multitude of of, um, of opportunities for students. Small but mighty, I'm sure. Absolutely. Um, so you talked a little bit about, you know, working with Native students um, to kind of prep them or put them on the path for college. How else does the Office of Higher Education work with tribes and Native people across Minnesota? You know, that's something I'm working every day to uh, to improve and to build upon. Um, one of the things I'm, I'm most excited about is um, is our, our tribal consultation mandate, actually. Um, we at the Office of Higher Education have a specific statutory mandate um, that's in addition to uh, the current requirement uh, to for all state agencies to meaningfully consult with tribal nations. We have a, a specific provision, um, and it's one that's actually shared with the Minnesota Department of Education as well. Um, so, you know, we have some of the strongest consultation uh, requirements and that gives us the ability to, you know, work with with tribal nations in a, a totally unique and different way. Um, we do so through our relationship with a body called the Tribal Nations Education Committee, and um, it's actually quite an advantage, I believe, not only to me personally but to the agency, um, in that I previously served as a member of the Tribal Nations Education Committee, and um, that's a that's a body that was. Um, that was developed by tribal directive, essentially uh, you know, all elected tribal leaders in the state at one time uh, passed resolutions through both the Minnesota Chippewa tribe, uh, the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council to develop this body because they felt they wanted their subject matter expertise, uh, experts, um, those with subject matter expertise um, to, to provide advice on, on educating Native students. And so we work really closely with with the Tribal Nations Education Committee. Um, they're all um, representatives of, of their individual respective tribal nations. They are primarily tribal education directors um, and they give us great insight into uh, policy proposals, budget proposals, um, you know, ideas that we may wanna consider uh, to move forward. Um, so it's just a really valuable membership. Um, one of the one of the key programs that uh, that we work closely with tribal nations on um, is our Minnesota Indian Scholarship Program, and that's a that's a program actually that has been on the books um, in Minnesota statutes since the 1950s, and it, it received a, a really small appropriation at the time from the state legislature, and has been growing ever since. Um, and you know, I'm proud to say that. We now have a what I call a fully funded Minnesota Indian Scholarship Program. Uh, my predecessor actually 
um, you know, saw a historical waiting list as a, an injustice and, you know, fought for, um, for appropriate funding for that program. And so we no longer have a waiting list. We can now, uh, you know, we have the ability to fund any Native students um, that qualifies and, and applies for the Indian Scholarship Program. And one thing I'm most proud of uh, is that last year during the, uh, during the legislative session, we were able to uh, pass some really um, important language, important not only to me, but to, to Native students who are looking to access this program, as well as to, uh, to, to our tribal nations. Uh, the program was historically limited to students who possessed um, one-fourth degree Indian blood or one-quarter ancestry. And, um, you know, we felt that that was, that was somewhat limiting, uh, particularly to our tribal nations that don't utilize uh, blood quantum as a, a means to determine citizenship or membership. And so we added language to include uh, citizens or members of tribal nations in addition to that one-quarter blood quantum. Um, and also incorporated language uh, around uh, members of Canadian First Nations as well. And, you know, the reasoning behind that really was um, I didn't feel as though a, a state agency had the authority to, you know, uh, have language in statute that uh, determined who is and isn't a member of a tribal nation um, and, and who, who is and isn't eligible for um, much needed and, um, and valuable scholarship. Um, funding for, you know, to pursue their higher education. And so that was, that was one of the, the things I zeroed in on last uh, session. And I'm happy that the legislature um, agreed and, and uh, agreed to, to pass that language. And so we're now excited that we have a really comprehensive um, Indian scholarship program. And, you know, we're going to continue to build uh, from there as well, additional flexibilities even. That's really exciting. And and you touch on something that I think, um, you know, it doesn't get talked about a lot and that's blood quantum. And unfortunately, um, that wasn't something that was uh, devised by native people. Uh, it was a, a, something the federal government invented. Um, and there's still a lot of programs out there that you need to have that quarter blood um, qualification, despite the fact that many tribal nations are, are doing away with that requirement for citizenship. Um, because if we kept it, it right, our, our community communities would be diminishing. And uh, in a lot of ways, that is one of the, the federal governmental policies that, in my opinion, is a genocidal policy that's still unfortunately around today. Um, I just had to, to touch on that a little bit. Um, but the, the Native scholarship, where do students go to access that? So we have all the information on the Minnesota Office of Higher Education website. It includes um, information on how to apply eligibility requirements and um, the actual application is there as well. And so be happy to share that with uh, with listeners following the call. We can, we can do some uh, some some links, sharing of the links. Perfect. That would be great. And that scholarship um, is available to be used at any of the colleges here in Minnesota. That's correct. Fantastic. Um, that's wonderful. I know students are always asking and looking for resources. Do you have a, a comprehensive resource of scholarships available um, on your website or, or accessible somewhere? Yeah, we do actually. Um, and that's something, you know, we're always looking to build upon as well. Um, we've utilized a list developed actually by some colleagues uh, at Minneapolis Public Schools uh, in their Indian Education uh, Office. They kept a list of all. Um, scholarship opportunities specific uh, to Native students, not only within Minnesota, but all of the national scholarship opportunities as well. Um, scholarships from the uh, American Indian College Fund um, and some other, um, some other private programs as well. And so we post that list and update it regularly. And then, um, you know, one of, the, one of the most exciting pieces about um, our involvement with the Minnesota Indian Scholarship too is that we have a dedicated staff person that uh, serves as an outreach liaison. And, you know, she visits uh, high schools, middle and high schools um, all across the state, um, visits uh, uh, tribal nations, uh, meeting with their tribal education directors and shares information that way as well. And so, you know, we try to disseminate not only key info about our own scholarship, but 
all of the opportunities available and you know some of the, some of the most uh, impactful programs are are our, our own scholarship programs from our tribal nations and so if you couple you know that funding along with funding available through through our agency and and others um you know you put a pretty uh, attractive financial aid package together for a student yeah. And I think, you know, it, it's nice that those resources are out there. I think a lot of students too have trouble navigating, um, you know, especially first generation college students kind of finding, figuring out how to put all those together um, so that they can break down that financial barrier that many of our, our students face. Um, I'm going to switch gears a little bit, uh, talking about kind of that achievement gap. Um, here in Minnesota, we're really lucky. We have a really wonderful education system, kind of one of the best in the country. Um, but we also have a really huge achievement gap um, between, you know, our, our white citizens and our native students and our other students of color. Uh, the graduation rates, you know, are are fewer for our, our native students and other students of color. Um, why do you think these exist still today? And and you know, maybe what is the what is your office doing to address some of these achievement gaps? Yeah, that's that's a really important question. Um, one that that many of us wrestle with every day. Um, it's something I I wake up thinking about. It's it's something I go to bed thinking about. Honestly, um, I have to share a story with you before I get into a little bit of our, of our response. Uh, it just reminded me, um, you know, I, I had mentioned. Um, well, actually, I think I failed to mention, but I, I served also as um, the state Indian education director at the Minnesota Department of Education uh, prior to joining the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council, and the the month I was I was appointed as a state Indian education director by then Commissioner uh, Brenda Casilius, um, I was kind of getting my my feet wet, understanding you know the role of of the office, the role of the agency. Um, I was searching for information, and this was in 2012. And um, a report came across my desk, and it was uh, graduation rates by state. And I started flipping through and I saw Minnesota on a couple of pages. Um, of course, being in the, the Office of Indian Education, I wanted to look specifically at graduation rate for American Indian students. Um, so I started looking through the states one by one, going down the page, flipping a sheet, flipping the next sheet. I finally found Minnesota on the last page at the bottom. Minnesota at the time was 50th out of 50 states for graduating Native students on time within four years. I think the graduation rate at that point was 42%. And I remember a couple days later reading a report from the National Indian Education Association, NIEA, and their president at the time actually declared a state of emergency. The, the organization declared a state of emergency around graduation rates for, for Native students. And um, I, my skin's crawling right now just talking about this. But, you know, when I when I hear state of emergency, when we all hear state of emergency, and, you know, all of us have been living within, within an emergency over the last couple of years, you know, you think of an all-hands-on-deck approach. You think of any possible resource you can uh, you can produce and mobilize to address that particular issue. It is, it is that critical. And folks in Indian education really didn't see that, that sort of response, um, things they had been calling on for, for decades, um, you know, additional funding, additional culturally specific resources, uh, additional mental health supports. Um, since that time, you know, we've, we've slowly been building, we've been making incremental increases. Um, but, you know, to your point, Minnesota does represent some of the largest gaps still in the nation not only for our Native students, but you also mentioned, uh, you know, students from other racial and ethnic backgrounds are students of color as well. Um, and that translates into higher education. And we have a, um, a statewide educational attainment goal, and it was actually a 10-year goal set in 2015 by the legislature. And that goal says uh, essentially that Minnesota wants 70% of its adults uh, age 25 to 44 to attain some sort of post-secondary credential beyond high school. 
And that's actually one of the loftiest attainment goals in the nation, that 70%. You know, I think right now we sit second only behind uh, Massachusetts in terms of higher ed attainment overall. But again, we have some of the largest gaps in the nation. When I look at our, our native student attainment, we currently are at 28%. When we started in 2015, uh, looking at the data, looking at the attainment data, we were at 22%. So we've made some gains, but they are incremental gains. And you know, I don't want to minimize them. We should celebrate them, but we have a long way to go. And so, you know, those are the reasons why our office, you know, not only looks at, at what all students in Minnesota need, but we look at some of those specific uh, resources that, that need to be mobilized to address this, what I still consider to be a state of emergency in graduation and attainment. Um, you know, I, I referenced the, the changes we made to the, the Indian scholarship. You know, if we can continue to, um, to make positive changes that bring additional resources to students that typically have not had access or opportunity to those resources um, or didn't know where to look, you know, then I think we're on our way. And that coupled with the efforts of, you know, not only my agency, but a lot of our, uh, a lot of our agencies in partnership with our nations, you know, I think we'll, we'll get there and close those gaps. There's a lot of work we can do to improve education here in Minnesota. The opportunity is to improve the way Native American history and culture is taught to our youngest students in K-12 schools. And the vast majority of Minnesotans agree. My tribe recently commissioned a statewide public opinion survey. It found that 90% of Minnesotans support teaching more Native American content in public schools. This survey confirms our belief that improving the accuracy and amount of Native subject matter in schools has overwhelming support among all Minnesotans, regardless of political affiliation, age, or geography. You can learn more about the survey in our campaign at understandnativemn.org. Now, back to our episode. Um, the University of Minnesota recently announced a tuition waiver for Native students um, across the state, which I think is a, a step in the right direction to, you know, closing that achievement gap by providing more access. Um, the University of Minnesota is also a land grant institution, which means, um, right, they, they're here, uh, because of land that in many cases was taken away from native people and given to institutions like the University of Minnesota. Um, so I think that was a, a wonderful gesture. What else is going on across the, the colleges uh, here in Minnesota to help reduce some of those barriers? Yeah, you know, it's actually an exciting time in, in higher education because, you know, we are starting to move towards a place where um, you know, students may not in the future have to worry about as many as many barriers as they do right now, uh, you know, in terms of, of getting their education. Um, you know, our campuses are becoming by the day more student centered, um, you know, and it may be um, signaled by some of the additional financial aid resources, like you just mentioned, some of the opportunities at the University of Minnesota. Um, but we're now seeing um, campuses address some of those worries around the costs associated with, with college outside of tuition and fees. Because a student, you know, still has a life outside of, of the classroom and has to worry about, you know, transportation and housing and food. And if they're a student parent, child care, you know, and so we're seeing uh, campuses respond to those additional those additional needs and those additional costs of, of going to college, um, you know, providing greater resources. So uh, we're now seeing food pantries on campus and campuses really focusing on addressing um, basic needs of students. You know, so addressing um, addressing transportation, for instance, um, making emergency grants available to students so that you know, a small car repair or a medical bill doesn't derail them from continuing their education. Um, we're seeing campuses deploy resources around connecting students to, um, to outside resources like uh, eligibility for, for SNAP benefits, 
Um, you know, we're seeing additional resources for, like I said, student parents. So, um, you know, certainly, certainly more, more to be done, but it's, it's been a, a really refreshing, um, you know, journey thus far to see campuses respond to students in the ways that they've been asking for, for a long time. Talking about accessibility um, and thinking about the pandemic, uh, I think we've really seen an acceleration and, you know, campuses forced to really adapt to technology and online classes. And what do you think that means for higher education going forward? Um, you know, the, this trend of online school, uh, is it here to stay? Are we going to go back to more traditional? Um, what do you kind of foresee for higher education after the pandemic? Yeah, it's a great question, um, you know, and, and kind of yet to be determined, honestly, I think, um, you know, individual institutions, as well as just higher education overall, um, you know, are thinking through this, but what, what it has done is, is opened up more options, or at least highlighted the options that have always been available. Um, you know, a lot of our community and technical colleges uh, across the state uh, have always made you know, distance education available to some degree, you know, understanding that they need to um, they need to go to where people are and you know where they have the ability to plug in, whether that's um, you know from a from a small uh, community in Greater Minnesota, you know, plugging into the campus that's maybe too far away to drive. Um, you know, I, I think I think those distance opportunities are certainly here to stay and. Um, you know, technology now has the ability to be leveraged greater than ever before. We're now seeing simulation labs for, you know, health degrees uh, happen over, over Zoom and, and in technology where that was, that was strictly something that, you know, you would have to have to be in person for. Um, but, you know, there are certainly going to be students that are going to be um, attracted to an on-campus option and the, the campus community um, and they're going to look for, you know, in-person opportunities, no matter what's available to them. But I think this just opens up everybody's world, um, increases access. And, you know, I am really excited for, um, you know, for those that maybe have felt they didn't have a, an appropriate option. Well, now they do. Yeah, um, that's great. It's great to hear that we've, you know, got these wonderful solutions to to some of the barriers and that, um, actually that we were still be able to move forward uh, during the pandemic. Did you see a, a huge drop in graduation rates over the last couple of years or student enrollment because of the pandemic? I know um, I have nieces and nephews who are college age and it, it was hard for them to, you know, think about paying a regular college tuition, but not be able to go on campus. Yeah, um, definitely a, a reduction in enrollment, you know, almost across the board. Uh, some of our um, our larger universities were able to uh, experience kind of smaller enrollment uh, dips, and you know, for the most part, maintained enrollment. But you know, they also um, provided different experiences and opportunities to students um, that some of our our campuses just simply couldn't provide. Um, you know, and then a lot of our students had to make a choice as well. Um, you know, a choice between continuing to um, to pay for childcare, make a choice to uh, potentially go to work rather than continue with education. And so you know, there's a, a multitude of different factors there. But yeah, we did see a pretty significant and are still experiencing a significant uh, reduction in enrollment. Um, and that's something new for us. You know, our, um, our, our research professionals within our agency um, have, have seen historical trends previously where you know, if, if the economy is doing really well, typically, you know, enrollment in, in higher education um, is down a little bit. And, you know, it kind of runs counter cyclical to the economy. If the economy is not doing well, we'll see high enrollment in, in higher education where, you know, folks feel as though they may not have to work. You know, they might want to take advantage of, of uh, a degree, you know, building upon their skills, uh, an opportunity to reskill or upskill. And we really didn't see didn't see that during the pandemic. So some of those historical trends that we relied on to predict um, just haven't shown up yet. They they may soon, but yeah, it it makes it really difficult to you know predict kind of funding and and what our uh, you know what our institutions ultimately need. Yeah. 
Um, you know, higher education in Minnesota is really important to our economy. Um, we've got a lot of fields here in Minnesota that rely kind of on our educational institutions to supply their future workforce, whether it's, you know, medical with, with the Mayo system and, you know, we've got technology with 3M and, a you know, large agriculture business. Um, how does the Office of Higher Education kind of partner with Minnesota institutions um, to ensure that there's a, a pipeline for the the people that call Minnesota home. That's a great question. You know, we work really closely with our um, our Department of Employment and Economic Development uh, Deed to look at um, you know current labor market data, um, where some of the the, the most in demand um, jobs are in the states. Um, you know, we also look or work closely with the Minnesota Department of Education too, understanding that you know those in in school right now are our future workforce and our our future uh, students that you know that'll engage in higher education. And so, you know, our three agencies in particular work really closely together. Um, yeah, but you know, a lot of the decisions we we do make are in response to you know what our Minnesota economy needs not only right now. You know, but maybe into the short and and long term future as well. Um, you know what we do know though is that over seventy percent of the of the jobs in demand, you know, will require some sort of or do require some sort of credential beyond high school. Um, you know, and so we want to make sure we're sharing that message. Um, you know, those jobs that pay a, a family sustaining income, um, you know, also require. Uh, some sort of post-secondary credential for the most part. And those are also jobs that are attractive to folks because they give a uh, greater growth opportunity and, um, you know, an opportunity to, uh, to, to continue to build upon, you know, what education you may have. But, you know, one of the things we, I don't want to say necessarily struggle with, but, you know, something we have to improve our messaging on is um, just the term higher education. You know, when I say higher education, I I tend to believe people think I'm talking about four-year degrees or, you know, professional degrees. Uh, you know, we need to change that narrative. I mean, higher education can be anything from an industry-recognized credential to a short-term certificate or diploma, uh, a training program, um, you know, and then through through degree seeking programs and associates degree and associate of arts and associate of science and so on. Um, and yes, then, you know, jobs are out there that certainly do require uh, four year degrees and advanced degrees. But we want to make sure that all of those options are on the table for, for students and understand exactly what is needed for a particular job. There are some incredible jobs out there that don't require a four year degree. But still, you know, our, our institutions have a, a place and a role to make sure that they're prepared appropriately. So, um, you know, I'll just I'll just say to, uh, you know, in addition to the state of, of Minnesota as a whole, you know, Rebecca, I think you well know, I mean, uh, when I talk to Native students, you know, I, I tell them these same things because our own communities need these same things as well. I mean, our, our tribal nations need police officers and conservation officers and biologists social workers and doctors, lawyers, cultural resources, professionals, I mean, you name it. Um, you know, so we want to make sure that that students understand, you know, there's ability within the state as a whole, within, you know, the country, but even right, right here at home, you know, we have those same needs, uh, you know, as, as governments too. Yeah, I, I think that's a good point. You know, there's a, a lot of ways to get, you know, a, an advanced degree. And I think when I think of the Minnesota um, Department of Higher Education, I think of a traditional four year college. Do you work with, you know, the trade schools like like the Dunwoodies? And and is that all encompassing when we talk about higher education? Yeah. And we actually um, we license and register every uh, private program in the state. And so, you know, that ranges from our large uh, private nonprofit colleges and universities that you're probably most familiar with, but yeah, all of the, uh, the smaller private training programs as well. Um, and, and everything and anything in between. I mean, you know, we work closely with our, our two large Minnesota public systems, the University of Minnesota system, um, and the Minnesota State College and University system as well. And 
you know, Minnesota State alone has has 30 uh, community colleges and technical colleges, you know, all all two year two year colleges. And so, you know, we're we're partnered really closely with with all institutions across the state because we want to make sure, you know, as we're building the most educated consumer, you know, we can in looking at higher ed options, we want to make sure students know everything that's possibly available to them, whether it's small, medium or large, public or private. Um, you know, we want to make sure students have the best fit. Yeah. Um, and I think some of those trades right now are in high demand and they're well-paying jobs. I know um, I've got friends that are electricians and they're begging people to, you know, uh, to study elect- uh, being becoming an electrician and being an apprentice uh, because they're hurting for people. How how do you support um, kind of those trade more like trade associations or trade style jobs at the Department of Higher Education? Yeah, one of one of the coolest programs we have is actually in partnership with our Department of Labor and Industry, who works really closely with apprenticeship programs. Uh, we have uh, a grant program that actually uh, awards funds to industry partners to be able to support kind of an earn while you learn um, opportunity for folks. And so, you know, they're able to bring on um, individual workers or a cohort of workers that are looking to receive advanced training um, in a multitude of different areas, but they are all in those high demand areas that you just mentioned. So, you know, we award funding in. Uh, in the healthcare field, uh, IT, in advanced manufacturing, you know, we're seeing some incredible things uh, happen in, in manufacturing here in the state, um, you know, and then and then also looking at potentially some new career fields as well, um, transportation, we had mentioned a few times, uh, you know, childcare, looking at, you know, potential opportunities for childcare as well, Um so yeah, there, there's um, there's some great opportunities, and we're partnered really closely be, with with industry there because that program in particular is actually industry led, and so this is a this is a place for them to be able to find um, you know qualified workers or folks willing to work and and earn a credential while on the job. That's great. Um, I know one of the things I wanted to touch on that we haven't really talked about was tribal colleges and universities. Um, you know, a lot of times it's a wonderful opportunity for Native students to um, kind of be able to dip their toes in the water as far as, um, you know, trying out college um, and then kind of readies them to to move on into the bigger educational systems. How do you partner and work with tribal colleges and universities here in Minnesota? Yeah, thanks. Great question. We have uh, we have four tribal colleges here in Minnesota. We're actually really fortunate uh, to to have that many tribally controlled institutions. Um, and actually, uh, can I interrupt you for just one second? And can you tell us a little bit about um, you know what is a tribal college and what makes it different from you know one of the state institutions? Yeah, sure. So uh, a a tribal college. Um, really is, uh, it's a fully accredited uh, college or, or university um, that is controlled by, um, by a, an individual tribal nation. So the elected tribal leaders of an individual tribal nation um, would either elect or appoint a board that then acts as the, uh, the governance and leadership structure of a tribal college. But um, all other processes are, are pretty much the same as um, as what you would consider a, a traditional community or technical college or, or university. Go through the same accreditation process and actually have, um, you know, sometimes even even uh, more stringent accreditation requirements as a tribal college. Um, there is some specific federal funding available for tribal colleges, but primarily they are. Um, they are governed by uh, by leadership of tribal nations. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And so, yeah, in Minnesota, we actually, you know, we have four: uh, the the White Earth Tribal College, uh, Red Lake Nation College, uh, Leech Lake Tribal College, and then a very unique institution, not only in Minnesota but in the country, uh, Fond du Lac Tribal and Community College. It's the only tribal college that's also a community college uh, member of a public system. And so um, they are um, a tribal college and um, a campus of the Minnesota State College and University system. 
And it's the only one in existence in the country. Um, yeah, it's, you know, so, yeah, it's it, it's an incredible, actually, backstory there, you know, maybe, uh, maybe a conversation for another day, but, um, you know, they... Um, they are, are just incredible institutions in that, you know, just what you said, um, they, they provide opportunities for students who, you know, may have not traditionally pursued higher education. And what, what's unique about them is that, uh, you know, they're, they're surrounded in, in cultural opportunities um, and, you know, really, really provide that, that extra sense of community uh, you know, to a student to to make them feel as though they're at home, and you know, I, I think you you feel that when you walk onto a campus of a, of a tribal college. Um, in terms of of how we work with them uh, at the Office of Higher Education, uh, we're actually working to incorporate tribal colleges into into all of our work at all levels. Uh, last year, actually, we were able to add a tribal college student representative to the state student advisory council. So that was that's typically a student from the University of Minnesota, a student from our private institutions, a student from Minnesota State, and we felt that it was important to also have tribal college voice on that board as well. And so, you know, that may seem like a like a somewhat small step, but that's our opportunity to make sure that tribal colleges are fully seen and heard and represented in all of our work and eligible for all of our state funding. Um, you know, just because they're they're a tribally controlled college doesn't mean that they're not an appropriate higher ed option for students in, in the state. Yeah, um, I think you know, at tribal colleges and universities, um, they've found ways to retain their students, to graduate their students. Is there elements of of what they're doing, whether it's building community or incorporating culture and language? Um, that do you think could transfer over to uh, the other college systems in Minnesota to to help uh, kind of boost the the retention and graduation rates of Native students across those other systems? Yeah, I you know I really am a firm believer in that strong support network that's built at uh, built at a tribal college. Um, it is that community. Um, it is strong representation of uh, of native culture, you know, within the building. But more so than that, um, it, it feels like a family because a majority of the leadership at a tribal college, a majority of the faculty and staff at a tribal college, are native themselves, and experience many of the same things that students that walk through those doors, you know, are carrying with them. Um, and it's it's that deep level of 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 understanding um, that really, you know, makes sure a student feels comfortable and has the ability to go to anyone within the building with with a unique issue that may be unique to a native student, and and have it addressed without question or without much explanation because the faculty and staff and and leadership understand where that student's coming from. Uh, I think that's absolutely key, you know. And we look at research around you know the impact of of teachers of color and American Indian teachers in the classroom at the, the K-12 level and, you know, what an impact that has on, on a student's ability to, you know, feel welcome at school, feel understood, feel seen, feel heard. Um, the same is true in our, our higher education institutions. You know, I, I shared that I, I went to the University of Minnesota and I had my first Native educator in front of a classroom in college, I never had that opportunity. Um, you know, in, in elementary, I mentioned I went to, to tribal Head Start, but that made me feel that I was in a, a small community within a really large university. Just that element alone, you know, that, that I could hang out in some of those advising offices. And so it's that it's that sense of community, I think, that really makes the difference for students. Yeah, absolutely. I went to the University of Arizona. That's where I did my undergrad. And I remember my first uh, Indian law course that I took. And I'll never forget that professor's name because it was the first time I'd ever had an uh, Indigenous professor. Uh, her name was Eileen Luna and she was fantastic. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I can completely understand that. I know um, the Shakopee Midwakton Sioux community has a scholarship for Native students at the University of Minnesota. And we've seen 
in that group, um, better retention and graduation rates uh, than the rest of the indigenous students across campus. And I, I think it's for those same reasons. It's that sense of community, that sense of belonging, that um, kind of, you know, making sure that group stays together brings. Um, I know we're we're winding down on, on time here. So I am just have a couple of wrap up questions. Uh, I, we could chat all day and that would be lovely, but um, I know you got to get back to work too. So uh, just, you know, where do you see the future of higher education in Minnesota going? Wow. That's, that's a great question. Um, you know, I don't have a crystal ball. I, I wish I did. Um, you know, I, I had mentioned earlier just some of those some of those additional supports that are now available to students. I mean, I'd love for us to get to a point uh, in the future and hopefully in the near future, you know, where a student doesn't have to worry about anything other than getting their education. You know, and 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 that means removing as many barriers as possible as we can, whether they be financial barriers or other. Um, you know, students have, have faced for decades, you know, issues around, around just, just living, honestly, you know, just food and, and transportation and housing and childcare, like I mentioned before. And, you know, if, if we can address those things for students so that they can solely focus on, on their education, you know, I think we'd be all the better and, and our, our institutions are certainly moving in that direction. Um, you know, I'll always advocate for, for increased financial aid, for specialized and targeted programs that bring information and resources to students that typically, you know, don't have the, the opportunity or the access. You know, that's something I think about and fight for every day. I'd love for that not to be a worry anymore um, in higher education. I, I think we're getting there. And, you know, I just, I have to say, I appreciate the partnership of uh, of all of our institutions uh, that are are receptive to you know some of the ideas that that we're bringing that our students are bringing uh, you know or that we're developing together, I think we're on a good path. I think so too. Um, just one last thought: uh, if you could give Native students any piece of advice as they navigate uh, their higher education journey, what would it be? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I would say to a to a native student, um, you absolutely belong. I hope you know you uh, you see yourself at every table. I hope you see yourself uh, belonging in every classroom and in every institution in the state. Um, you're certainly worthy. Um, you know, I would tell a native student that that we need you. We all need you. The state needs needs you as a native student to. Uh, to succeed, you know, not only your own, your own community, but the state. Um, this isn't necessarily one piece of advice. This is, I guess, many pieces of advice. But you know, I would just tell a native student too to um, to start early in exploring. You know, because you absolutely belong, and um, you know, don't ever tell yourself that you're not ready for higher education. Uh, but when you are ready, you know, higher education here in Minnesota will be ready for you. I think that's wonderful advice. Commissioner Olson, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I appreciate it. I know our listeners are going to love this episode. And uh, thanks again for your participation. Thank you so much. Absolute honor to join you. Thank you for joining me for the Native Minnesota podcast. For more episodes, please subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. You can also visit our website, understandnativemn.org, to learn more about our campaign's work to improve the Native narrative in Minnesota's public schools.